And now I'm letting everybody in. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Just yeah. give it a couple um, minutes here to get everybody in and seated. Oh, it works because everybody's trying to I think we will have everybody mute if you can to start out with. We will, there's going to be time later, but we'll unmute you. But there we go. Looks good. Oh, it's so great to see people's faces. Yes. Good morning, Sebastian. Jessica, Stacy. Morning. Good morning. Hi, Julie Stoker. Hey, Trish. <laughs> I don't know. Good morning, James. Good morning. Just giving it another couple minutes as people come in. Great. Nice to have a representation for Branson. Some. It's so cool to see people from all over the state that are all in this room together and all across the country. Actually, we have some LA and New York people. I'm so excited. Look at that. Good morning, that. Good morning sir. Good morning, Sean Cloud. All right. Hey, I'm here. Coming up. up. There. <laughs> Lovely office, Sean. Just getting set here. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Great. Let's see, still coming in here. Got hey, some Michael. Later faces. <gasps> ML Bass. Good morning. <laughs> Potato Mike. What? Love. Love your name. <laughs> All right. Just another, they keep, the number keeps moving up. So I'm gonna give it another minute here. You can all scroll through and look around, see who's here. Hey, Tony Cabral, good to see you from Chicago. Hey. Zooming hey. in from Chicago, love it. Morning, Matthew Long. Natalie with those lovely glasses, love those. Morning to you, David. And hi, Sean Wallace. Hey. Morning, morning. Welcome, Bob, Bob Singleton. Hello to you. Well, thanks, you guys, for coming on a Saturday morning early. We all have our coffee. We're all coffeeed up or sodaed up or whatever we do in the mornings. Um, my name is Andrea Sporsick Clund. I am the film commissioner for the state of Missouri, and I um, man, this last year has been crazy, right? This pandemic, which has kept us all isolated and, and distant, but we're creating these opportunities to build community. And um, this uh, series that we are kicking off right now has been something we've been wanting to do for a long time, um, doing a film summit and bringing a lot of people together from the different parts of the state. I tell people all the time, we have these dynamic, passionate groups of, of exciting things happening all over the state. St. Louis has got stuff going on, Kansas City, Springfield, Branson, Columbia, and not, and you guys don't all know each other. And I know all of you and in my head, you guys should all know each other, but you don't. So I love that we're gonna be able to do this um, and, and introduce people to, to you and, and to each other. And the whole idea is that we build our film and video community across the state. Um, we have some, um, expats that are joining us from Chicago and New York and LA. Um, the Missouri Film Office has been around since 1983. Don't know how many of you know that. It's been a long time. I did, wasn't around for it then. I started in 2005. Um, uh, two things that my office is, is charged to do, recruit projects to the state of Missouri and to support the industry here in the state. And just briefly, a couple things that we do um, to align those efforts. One of them is the Missouri Stories Script Writing Fellowship Program. Many of you probably know about, and we have some of our winners and submitters on this call right now. Um, that program was created to um, 
inspire more Missouri set TV and film projects in the hopes that more would eventually get made here in Missouri. So that's that program. We also do marketing trips. I work with Steph uh, Shannon and uh, Renee Eichelberger from St. Louis. We go to Los Angeles and New York to promote Missouri as a place to film every year, except this last year, because we couldn't go. Um, we also attend the Sundance Film Festival to have a presence of Missouri in, in the industry uh, nationally. And then um, last but not least, we support 16 in-state film festivals across the state, which is pretty awesome that we have that many in our state. And this was a rough year for film festivals. And I was so impressed with the pivot that, all, that they all made to go online and do what we're doing right now, um, cre creating a community uh, virtually. So 16 film festivals. And then we also have 38 film programs that are teaching college students across the, the state about filmmaking. And I work, try to work as much as I can with those schools to keep those students here in the state and working. So just a few things that my office does. We're partnering on this series with the Missouri Motion Media Association that was created to be an ad advocacy group for my office because there are some things I can't do as a state employee. Fundraise is one of them <laughs> and also some legislative things that I can't do. So we work in tandem together and I wanna introduce the president of the Missouri Motion Media Association, Michelle Davidson. Thank you, Andrea. Hi everybody, it's good to see you all virtually. So I'm the new president of MoMA, the M Missouri Motion Media Association, and I am not going to bury the lead. We're very excited that we have a new bill just filed. It's Senate Bill 367. It's the Show Missouri Film and Digital Media Act. And because our organization is all about advocating, like Andrea said, um, for that incentive and just advocating for production across the state, um, we act as uh, an organization so we can lobby um, and legislate, uh, educate our legislators about it. So this act, um, which we hope will pass and, and we'll get our tax incentive back, that is the goal, but it's, a, it's an ongoing battle. Um, this one is 25% for qualifying in-state expenses. And then there are a few bumps like 5% here, 5% there. We have a new bump that we added this year that uh, basically is awarded to uh, those projects that show Missouri in a positive light um, or encourage tourism across the state or in a specific area. So in this environment with the virus, it is going to be very hard for our legislators to think about new programs, but we need jobs and economic growth more now than ever. So it's about job stimulus. And so if you ever, uh, come across a legislator, maybe you know someone, or you have a specific representative that you can talk to, we wanna to stress to you that it's all about educating our legislators about the business side, the economic growth, jobs, tourism. And so while we have a volunteer board, we also have membership. And so we would love for all of you, um, if you are current members or renew, just go to our website, MoMA online, um, so that we can, fight to get that incentive back. We're watching neighboring states like Oklahoma reaping the rewards of film production. Uh, we're basically don't even have a seat at the table. So I've been on a few phone calls recently um, for my production effort. And, uh, and the first question they ask is, do you have an incentive? Which is really tough. So we want a seat at that table um, we want to be in those conversations. We want to be considered. And so please, uh, you know, check out MoMA online and see what we're doing. We have um, a little, I think you can enter in your information to make sure that you're up to date with our news. Um, it's $25 for membership and then it goes up for corporate members. Um, and again, we just appreciate you being here. We appreciate Andrea and everyone. Last year, MoMA led by Joni Tackett and Steph along with Andrea, you know, we got really far in this process. Um, since we lost the incentive back in 2013, um, and, you know, we can talk about all the benefits that we've seen. Some of you worked on films like Gone Girl. Uh, we just want to fight and to get that incentive back. Uh, but until then, we're also supporting events like this and we're excited to, um, to help you all network, um, and come together and, uh, we're excited to be a part of it. 
So one of the amazing people that made this bill happen is Steph Shannon, our vice president of MoMA and the director of the Casey Film Office. So we're so excited um, that she leads not only Kansas City, but us across the, straight, across the state to get production to come here. So I will let her take it away. I was on mute, but thank you so much, Michelle, for that very generous introduction. I'm the moderator for today's panel, and I'm really proud because we've got such a great uh, group of panelists. Uh, housekeeping, uh, during the panel, during the panel portion, if questions come up for you, please do put those in the chat. We'll have somebody looking at those and uh, aggregating uh, those questions to uh, bring to my attention. After uh, the panel, we will have a Q&A where uh, you can use your own voice to ask questions. We just ask that you raise your hand or you know, use the uh, reaction icon so that we can call on you uh, so that you can bring your question forward yourself. Uh, okay, well, let's get this panel started. I'm really excited to introduce these four people uh, who are generous with their time on a, on a Saturday morning. First off is Rachel, Rachel Kephart. Uh, who has a background in casting, freelance production work, and film incentive consulting for commercials and network television programs. Until the COVID pandemic, Rachel uh, worked with me at the Kansas City Film Office, and we sorely miss her, but she's been busy with other things, uh, such as leading the effort uh, for safe sets as the COVID coordinator and or COVID supervisor, for shows like American Ninja Warrior that filmed in St. Louis in 2020 and uh, Temptation Island that filmed in Hawaii in 2020. And next, I'm excited to introduce my friend, Eric Bowles. Eric is a nationally registered environmental health specialist and a registered sanitarian. He has more than 20 years of experience in environmental health for private, public and nonprofit organizations. Uh, he's currently employed as an environmental hygienist, yes, that is a job, at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Uh, Eric is the co-author of uh, our Kansas City Film Office document, A Safe Return to Production. Those guidelines uh, uh, introduce the role of an infection prevention, uh, infection prevention compliance supervisor. And I'm glad that the industry has changed that kind of uh, role to something simple like COVID coordinator or COVID supervisor. Uh, he's worked on commercial sets and corporate sets throughout the Midwest uh, on the side of his regular full-time job. Now we've got some production company folks. We have Austin Walsh who continuously draws inspiration from his real life experiences and passions with a knack for creating imagery that is genuine, uh, energetic and authentic. In the early 2000s, he founded what will eventually become AWS Studio, uh, AW Studio in the spare bedroom of his house. So, you know, everybody pay attention. If you're a small business owner, things like this are possible. Uh, since then, Austin and his team have grown the studio into the region's, one of the region's top production companies. Uh, they're headquartered uh, in Kansas City and now with a cache of photographers, directors, post-production partners that span North America, they support uh, productions of all sizes and all budgets. In fact, Austin was selected as a top 200 ad photographer worldwide in 2020. We're really proud that he's a Kansas Cityan. Next, across the state, we are introducing Pete Halliday, who is a 25 year veteran of the media production industry. Pete has produced content in just about every corner of the world. Uh, as executive producer, director, for uh, director of production for the company 90 Degrees West in St. Louis, Pete collaborates with advertising agencies and the world's biggest brands, uh, creating nationally recognized television commercial campaigns, branded content, marketing promotional pieces. Uh, he's been recognized with over a dozen Emmy wins in three different regional chapters of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Welcome panel. Uh, okay, I'm going to start with Austin. And the reason is because after our shutdown here in Kansas City, and I believe that we coincided with St. Louis pretty well, uh, the shutdown lifted at the very beginning of May 2020. And Austin's company was the first company I had heard of that had a production ready 
the week that everything opened to, to kick off the rest of, you know, our entire production community. So I wanted Austin, I wanted you to tell us about that experience and what special things you had to consider with your clients so that you could go out of the gate and shoot safely that very first week. Um, yeah, it was crazy. And first, thanks for, uh, you know, letting me talk with you guys. There's definitely a lot of producers and people that supported what we were doing. Um, I guess I'm just the one that gets to talk about it, but, um, it was crazy. It seems like years ago, and I guess now it's almost a year ago. Um, but yeah, I mean, to be totally honest, we didn't really know a lot about what we should do. So we called Steph and we called Eric and we're like, Hey, we've got things that we need to start doing. How do we do it the right way? And, um, but besides those uh, kind of safety calls, our next big call was to um, support internet because we knew that we'd have a small set. Um, at that time, it was like limited to 10 people. Halfway through the shoot, you could have like 15 people. You know, a few days later, it was based on the occupancy of the location you were in. So every day was kind of a new challenge, a new rule, a new restriction that we were you know, not trying to push it as far as we could, because we didn't want to just be like unsafe. But when you're trying to do a production that would normally have 30 people on set with 10, I mean, a lot of people were doing a lot of jobs. Um, the the pace of the day was slower. Um, you know, having multiple talent on screen, but not we were shooting multiple shots multiple times with green screen so that we could layer the talent in in post so that it looked like they were all on set. So, I mean, to be honest, it was uh, an open conversation. Like every night we were having after, after we'd wrap, we'd kind of have a regroup about, okay, how are we going to do tomorrow? What are the new rules tomorrow? We we're working very openly with the agency producers and creatives about just, you know, here's an idea. Can we do it? How do we do it? And, um, I mean, it was a learning experience for everybody. Nobody had ever been doing anything like this. And um, you, you're on a Zoom call for 10 hours uh, talking to creatives and clients across the country and wheeling this iPad around the set to be like, oh, you like this prop? And, you know, they did and, or they didn't. We'd find something else. So it, I think it was just more than anything, uh, all hands on deck. We all are thankful to be working. We're trying to do it the right way. And, and let's let's make good content even though we have some restrictions so there was one of your projects that was pretty early on where you had some kind of remote dp situation it, how, we did yeah how hard yeah. was that to put together for that project um yeah it was i mean i think for all of these um pre-production and pre-visualization -visual became more important than ever because you couldn't just be like oh hey instead of that blue cup we want a red cup it's like well we don't have a red cup, you know? So uh, knowing those things and being prepared and a lot of pre-production, a lot of talk about how you want the camera to move, a lot of mood boards. And so, yeah, it was a tabletop project um, for a beverage company. And uh, our, we had a DP in Chicago. So we just shipped him all the product, shipped him some backgrounds, some surfaces. And, uh, you know, I, we had worked together before, so it wasn't a totally, new relationship and that was another key thing was with the creatives that we were working with it was you know a lot of trust because that's just what you had to do well you mentioned eric bowles so eric i want to turn turn the question to you and like i said in the, your introduction we worked together on that uh safe return to production packet 54 pages long and you were such a champ to work with me on that for free and all of the sudden like we became best friends in about three days because we worked together like nonstop. and then you then you started working on set so he, it, there's a difference between creating these safety sort of guidelines and then walking onto a set and trying to practically apply that to talk about that process um i know early on it might be different than later on but tell us a little bit more about that because the practical application is really the important part to keep people safe. Yeah, um, that's a great point because I worked, I've worked i worked in public health for uh, many years and we always, there's a lot of head scratching when I knew some 
boss up in an office at the state somewhere was writing regulations. And I'm like, do they, have they ever even been in the field? Do they know? And so I was glad, thankful I had the opportunity to not only be a part of the writing, but be a part of figuring it out on, on the fly sometimes. Um, and it definitely was a challenge. And I think this has nothing to do with me, but I think it was we, between you and I, Steph, covered, you helped me with the things I didn't know about sets or the industry. Um, I think we covered, and maybe some of you out there that maybe use it initially uh, could have some good input too. Um, I think my um, struggle was not being on sets that often besides visiting my wife who is in the industry. Um, but then I think I had an advantage because I didn't have that pre-COVID set muscle memory that you all have. And that was the one of the biggest things I've seen people have to overcome that you can't have five people huddled around the monitor or um, uh, and well, and then finding my voice too, because I'm, uh, my wife always says, if I'm out in public and I keep my mouth shut, I'm really scary looking apparently. But as soon as I open my, my mouth, they're like, oh, well, he's just, uh, he's just a wimpy, oversized guy. Anyway, um, so finding my voice on set and Pete, I was on the set with Pete in St. Louis, uh, producers and some of the ADs have really helped um, make me feel a part of like the, and I'm going to screw this up here, the management team or whatever that layer is before to be able to have the comfort to say, Hey guys, Rachel, Shan and stuff, you got to move apart or we can't all be in the room at the same time. Like that. you have to have that be given that authority because yeah. it's a new position. Yeah. My second job was terrible um, with the, uh, the client and the agency. And this was when, I don't think anybody knows my second job. This was like when we were getting the photos from Lake of the Ozarks, where it was like partying early on in COVID. Oh, yeah. And those two groups on set felt like, oh, Lake of the Ozarks are here on set. Great. And I felt like I couldn't say anything because there was the producer in between me and I didn't want to jump that you know, I didn't want to overstep my position, but it was very uncomfortable and people on set working were very uncomfortable and came to me. And so going forward after that, the pre, pre-pro pre meeting and really getting buy-in or at least communicating with producer and AD and making sure we're all on the same page is a huge, um, a huge thing before going into a shoot. I, I would imagine so, because clients, you know, are catered to throughout that process and and it, it's talk about muscle memory. They're really used to kind of, you know, being being able to do whatever they want to do on a set. And and now who's this guy? You know, not not the director, not the you know AD coming to tell us to stop doing what we're doing. So yeah, it's absolutely key in the, the safety of a set for this role to be partnered with from the leadership on a set partnered with eight with agency if that's the way the shoe goes right or uh you know if those safety meetings like at the beginning of a, of a shoot and the shoots that you were on did those have actual clients in those or was that only for crew i mean usually it's only for crew yeah it's typically crew so maybe um, that piece is is yeah th th there was an occasion that we we would talk and say let's have another one once even when talent gets here too um so, and then I have more things to say, but I don't know when to say them, but like things that I've either learned or concerns I have going forward for all of you, for all of us. That's a question I'll have for all of the panelists. Do you wanna hold on to that quick? Sure, sure. Okay. okay, well, hold on to that because that's truly important. We need to learn as we go. That's this whole year is what we've been doing and will continue to do until this pandemic is over. Um, so let me, let me move to Pete though. I know that Pete, because I was on some Zooms with you early on, uh, you took this really serious. And I feel like you might've been, uh, I don't know if you were out of the gate 
you know, first week or second week, but it seemed to me like you were very concerned and being extremely careful and gathered as much information as you possibly could. And you, at one point, I think mentioned that you were even waiting for hoping that, you know, like the unions would issue some kind of safety guideline that, that hadn't manifested yet. And that would have been helpful. Can you speak to your experience on that? And then kind of as a follow-up, I wanted to know how your timelines and budgets were impacted by all of this. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, I'll take the first one. Uh, the first part of that, it was, uh, it was a little terrifying at the beginning, right? Cause it was, uh, uncharted waters and we didn't know um obviously there wasn't really a consistent message throughout all the communities rather just you know let alone the production community and uh Joni Tackett I reached out to to Joni uh in kind of like panic mode saying okay well you know I deal with a, a ton of freelance talent we're all a big family here in St. Louis um and you know we're lucky to have a fairly deep bench but not a a huge um set of resources in every department. And so we're all kind of intermingling between the production companies with the, a lot of the same crew. So, um, you know, I called Joni in a little bit of a panic and I'm like, well, I'm gonna, if I hire somebody on Thursday, I mean, I don't know where they were Tuesday and how does this all work and how do we get through it? And right around that time, uh, you know, she suggested that we uh, talk with Andrea and Renee and, and then uh, Steph, you jumped on the phone with us and um, just kind of started working through it. And that's right when the document hit and that, the document that you and Eric put together um, was, you know, took into account some of the notes that I was like writing down and trying to figure out and it just hit like at the perfect time. And that's when we all got connected and, um, and then it was time to start shooting again. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was out of a little bit of a panic uh, just because I wanted to make sure we were doing it right. Um, I, Obviously, as I mentioned, the crews here in St. Louis, and I'm sure all over the Midwest are, are pretty tight knit. And I wanted to make sure that we were providing safe environments for all of those people. Um, and that, you know, it would, it would absolutely just destroy me if I, if I knew that we did something to, to get somebody sick. So um, in, in meeting uh, with uh, the team here and, um, you know, my first big shoot that was, um, you know, larger than just the, the normal, um, you know, 10 person crew, we actually had a, a, a bigger one. You know, I, I brought Eric in from Kansas City just to kind of help us wrap our heads around it. And, um, you know, we brought in Eric uh, on the prep day so he could go through the tech scout with us and see the location and see how, it, you know, we could maintain uh, distancing and safety. Um, but that, uh, you know, that that muscle memory that Eric mentioned was, you know, right out of the gate evident when we had art department and lighting people and everybody trying to jam themselves into this dining room of this pretty good sized house, but it was still too close for comfort. And, you know, just uh, luckily a lot of the crew were on board with all this too and, and kind of policing each other, which was a, a big help that day because, you know, as Eric mentioned, you know, trying to find that voice of, you know, walking into a new situation, which I was glad that he was there because it, it wasn't me uh, doing it because I've known these guys for years. And I know, you know, again, because we're all so tight that it, it, listening to me sometimes is, uh, you know, somewhat of a challenge or taking me seriously because I'm uh, somewhat of a, we keep our sets pretty light, but uh, I think they could probably tell that I was a little bit, um, not on edge, but definitely uh, dialed oh, in. Eric's on those scary things. look was helpful. <laughs> he wasn't. That beard is new, so let me just say that he wasn't as scary back then. But um, but yeah, no, I, I think that was um, the biggest thing. So I, I thank you guys for your work on that, um, and everybody who was taking a lot of time. And I know we all were. I mean, production companies, um, you know, across the the state and across the country, were really just trying to all figure this out at the same time. And then luckily. Um, you know, we weren't, I don't think we were one of the first ones out of the gate, but what that allowed me to do is kind of sit back and stalk everybody's like social feeds and Instagrams. And I'm like, Hey, is he wearing a mask? And like, you know, I'm like trying to just, you know, just kind of see what everybody was doing um, and how they were doing it. And then, so when we did finally get back going, like I said, one of the first shoots we had out of the gate was a fairly good sized one. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned how does that affect timelines and budgets? Well, we had, um, uh, 
we, we brought in a, a motor home for the client that they were sequestered in that motor home all day at a safe distance. There were only two of them. We had the Zoom going all day. So the their clients and then the rest of the agency could dial in. Um, and, you know, just as Eric mentioned, everything kind of slowed down a lot. So that's part of the conversation in regards to timelines is kind of talking through the with the agencies and the clients as to what's possible and what the best approach is. We've I've seen some storyboards uh, come across my desk where we have to like have like a uh, an honest talk with them saying man I don't know how we can pull this off um you know you, you want this big you know wedding scene and that's not really going to happen right now so what are ways that we can kind of approach this creatively to get the same sentiment and then you know uh try to make make it work and and still still get your message across but it may not be look it, it may it might not look as boarded um and then timelines you know we're I'm in the middle of a pre-production uh, for a shoot that um, has been trying to to shoot in Northern California since um, I don't know November or so, and with everything that's changing there on a daily basis, um, and just you mentioned timeline-wise, um, you know, permits for example are taking 10 days longer than they used to. So now that prep and trying to find locations and trying to get those approved by our agency clients and then their clients that adds a whole nother level of planning and complexity. Um, you know, we, uh, we shot over the weekend where one of the shots was supposed to be up in the observation window of the arch. Well, it took finding out at the last minute that the arch has done a ton of COVID safety up in the observation deck with plastic and plexiglass. And, you know, it, we had, so we had to, you know, bring the agency on board and say, Hey, listen, this, this doesn't look how is how you remember it because it's completely different now. And how does that affect the shot? So, you know, it's it definitely the the prep and, and pre pro is a is a much bigger part of problem solving and and you know. But it, at the same time, I think the communication is the key. It's how it always has been. Um, and again, uh, oh, and and you mentioned budgets. Uh, this last job that I just did, our COVID budget was I think twelve and a half percent of the entire shoot budget. So um, it was a three day shoot with uh, talent. Now our talent we we cast in their own bubbles right so it was all family members uh in each scenes and things like that but we got everybody tested um and you know again when those when those costs come through um you know budget wise that's just another honest conversation that we have to have with the with the clients and um uh sometimes it's uh again either that affects the idea uh we have to tweak it a little bit or you know we just uh, roll with it and and they uh and pass those costs along so Right, right. So there has to be a, a real great understanding between you and your clients and you and the agency that things are different timeline wise, which is hard because commercial production moves so fast and has historically moved so fast and faster and faster over time. And then budgets, that's always a struggle. And then it, it you know, thinking about what you do, but then thinking about an independent filmmaker who's already just strapped to the max, trying to make something possible on a really small budget, this is a, it's a hit for them to make sure they're doing sure. things the safest way. But um, so speaking of doing things the safest way, uh, my next set of questions are for Rachel, Rachel Kephart. I believe that you started working, Rachel, after the, like the, the unions had gotten together and issued their own safety document. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but also you were one of the first like network productions up on its feet. And they implemented like this, the bubble theory that they'd written about. So you worked in, in a kind of a large bubble. Can you tell us about that and how that worked? What was challenging about that? What really was good about that for safety? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, in the last several months I've um, worked on like a variety of different um, projects, primarily like television. Um, and the bubble system is used in all of them uh, in some in way or another. Because I'm not sure. So I think the bubble system, we tend, I think the word is used pretty loosely, truthfully, but we tend to think of it in like the strictest sense, like the NBA bubble where, you know, everybody goes in and they stay put and you live, eat, sleep, you know, in one place and you don't leave if you have any intention of returning. And a lot of times those bubbles are preceded by a lot of testing 
um, before you're admitted and probably a quarantine as well. Um, truthfully, those types of bubbles, those really strict bubbles, I don't think are as common as people think. Um, they're logistically really difficult to pull off and practically and certainly financially incredibly expensive. Um, also just mentally exhausting for the people who have to live within those. Um, but what you tend to see on projects, um, usually bubble systems aren't really used for projects that aren't longer form. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to use them on something like uh, a commercial or, or something shorter. Um, it just isn't practical. But uh, for a longer form, there are a lot of different what I, I would sort of call like modified bubbles. So for instance, um, and I can't be like too specific about like which show. Um, Everybody, but... she signed a deal, so she's gonna do her best to, to... <laughs> <laughs> good information. But, um, you know, like, for instance, there might be some where the bubble exists on set. So um, crew might be going back to a hotel where they are, you know, have one floor and may, you know, cast will be going, you know, to their own floor. But really the, the isolation zone, the safety zone exists on the set. And so that would be a location where no one would be allowed to come in without testing previously. Certainly they would do all of the temperature checks and CDC health surveys before you entered, but it would be strict enough where like, for example, I, I was on a show where like, we didn't even let a vendor bring a printer in without being tested first. So if you, you know, bubbles typically are, are very, go hand in hand with testing, which isn't always practical or possible for productions, but um, I've been lucky enough to work on some that have. Um, and then you might have, you know, I worked on another project that was a, a more intense, much closer to the strictest sense of a bubble where we lived um, and worked within a resort for two months um, and we didn't leave. And the only times we did leave um, were when they were going to film uh, I never left, they didn't need me, thankfully, um, but where we were going to film in specific remote locations. Um, and those tend to be nine times out of 10, you're in private property. And what your goal is, is to extend your bubble into those locations. So you lock down the space, any location rep, rep or site rep, or any, even somebody has to unlock the gate, you would have tested by your team prior, uh, you clean the space. And the only people you send out are a skeleton crew of people. Um, and then a lot of times those would coincide with uh, pretty frequent testing routines and even heightened testing for those who leave. Um, you're doing a lot of testing, does that mean mask wearing or space is a little more lax inside the bubble? So, no, you, I, there are probably some productions that can, you know, like, I don't know, I didn't work on The Bachelor, I don't know anybody who did, but from what I understand from like working with other vendors, they were like a strict bubble. Um, and I would imagine, and I, I get the impression that because they didn't do any filming outside, they probably at some point, once you've tested consistently negative throughout your, you know, your group, you could probably take your mask off, especially if you're like working with talent, producers really like to be able to like connect with them, especially on a show like that where emotions run high. So in those types of situations, I would imagine you probably could lose the mask. Um, but I think if you're operating in any sort of like modified bubble, as soon as you take the risk of anybody leaving, um, the best thing you can do is, is be equally vigilant inside. Um, and sometimes that's to the annoyance of some of the people there, you know, they feel like they're living in a bubble and they shouldn't have to do this if everybody's testing negative, but you just never know. Um, and I tend to, I've been very lucky that the projects I've worked on, the producers have always wanted to err on the side of being extra cautious. Um, you know, certainly like with American Ninja Warrior, that was one of the first shows to film again. And it, it was a show with, you know, 500 people on it. And so that was one where the, this, they spent so much time ahead of time, you know, preparing and making sure everything was going to be perfectly safe. And they were incredibly vigilant about mask wearing. You know, there was a team of COVID compliance officers that were there. You know, it wasn't just one person. There were several that worked in shifts. There was people there 24 hours. Um, and so in those situations, whether there's an isolation zone or not, I think you, you just can't go wrong erring on the side of safety in those situations, so. Err on the side of safety. So 
Now, Eric, Eric, I know you're bursting at the seams to tell us about learning. And all four of you on the panel probably have a, an earlier and a later uh, kind of idea of how safety goes. And plus our, you know, the mandates, it, not our state mandates exactly, but like our local mandates all over the state um, or county mandates like have changed over time. I guess, uh, what what are what are some of the key learnings? And one thing, Eric, is specifically, I wanted to, you to mention was that one of the tricks that you kind of one of the tricks that you gave one of the sets to help mitigate that um, muscle memory um, was was a key word so that they can help police themselves easier because it's really hard to tell people that you're super good friends with. Like Pete was mentioning, like, hey, you need to step back or quit crowding my space you know people you don't you're not even thinking about it because you've worked in this industry for so long that's one of the things eric i want you to talk about and all four of you what have you learned what are some key tips and advice for people going forward that you you can give our audience yeah one of the one the beginning of one it was on the tech scout and one of the my friends that uh, I hadn't worked with before, but had met through my wife, um, came up to me and was really upset about, even on the scout, how close people were getting to him. And so we thought, well, maybe we can come up with a word, like a safe word. I thought it was a good idea. And we came up with something I thought was catchy. And it's been a bomb ever since. <laughs> but uh, with spacewalk, like, Hey, give me some space, walk away, space. Well, I don't know. Thought it was catchy. I think it's brilliant. In. Yeah, well, it worked for that job a little. And then everybody else, I don't know, thinks it's dumb. But <laughs> so that's, I liked it. Uh, another thing was, it was actually with Pete, where I realized we're, we're really good about staggering arrivals but I didn't think about staggering when you change from the living room to the upstairs bedroom for the next shot. It's like a herd of cattle going, and I'm like, ah, we got to stagger those too. So we quickly, and Pete helped quickly adapt to, okay, art goes up first or whatever the sequence was, but to stagger those next setups too. Um, and I think that's oh, can oh. I go follow up because the qu equipment cleaning and things like that were a big part of the safety guidelines. Yeah. Over time, the idea that that this the coronavirus is living on surfaces has somewhat changed. Yeah. Um, but 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 how do you still like safely make the environment safe? Like what are like the nitty gritty? What do you actually have to do to make sure the equipment is? So safe for people. Yeah. And no offense to anybody else, but I feel like the cleaning disinfecting part is by every, we, we deal with that a lot in the hospital. So I've learned a lot if, kind of before COVID um, and people are cleaning. Well, it started with, we were getting a lot of poison control calls and patients for lots of uh, unintentional poisonings of kids because we were all freaking out and buying every disinfectant. People were using Raid to disinfect, uh, just anything to kill anything. Um, and there's ways we got to do that. And there's such a focus on cleaning that uh, people are, were doing it wrong and doing it unsafe, uh, unsafely and spending a lot of money that they didn't need to spend. There's still a pretty heavy focus on cleaning and disinfecting but I don't think it needs to be as strong because we're finding, I definitely believe if I have it and I wipe my nose and I touch the handle and stuff comes in after me and touches it, then wipes her eyes, she's likely can get it from me. Uh, however, uh, it's definitely more mouth, I mean, the air from my mouth to your, your face, um, like they've had, we have to start wearing face shields as well within the hospital. So it's definitely eyes, nose, ear, or eyes, nose, mouth, uh, and less about 
cleaning, but I'm afraid to say that too much because I still think it's important, but I, I think we could take less, uh, and put take some of the emphasis off that. Now I still do when I'm on set, I set my alarm and every hour at least, or at the latest, I go around and clean high touch surfaces. I don't disinfect every time because that's just overkill, but cleaning with soap and water or, a so I use two things commonly or mostly baby wipes and disinfecting wipes. Baby wipes is a, a good substitute if you don't have soap and water, which we don't for cleaning. So I'll go through maybe the very first time and clean and disinfect. And then the next few times uh, I'll just clean with baby wipes or a cleaning product. And then maybe the fourth time I'll do this. And so I kind of do that cycle throughout the day. Um, but then I also, one other thing I think is important is if uh, Austin is just grab the iPad to hand to Stacy because she's going to be holding the eye. She's the talent and going to be holding the iPad for the shot. That it's important to kind of do some of that prop cleaning before um, upholstered type products are not our friend because uh, those aren't easily cleanable. So. I don't know if I went, if I'm going way off, but. Reconsidering what is chosen for yeah. the props on a set or the decorations for a set. I mean, curtains, sofas. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. when Austin was talking earlier about, you know, doing a green screen background, you, if you don't do that perfectly, you know, I mean, that's the extreme where you just have no props and you're you're just going to place somebody in. And I don't think you can do that every time. Austin, yeah. are you jiving with what he's saying about like the clean, cleaning of equipment and stuff like that? Because I mean, even with cameras, I mean, is it just that yeah. you, you don't share that nobody else touches your camera at all kind of thing? Like your, eight, your camera system? Um, you know, I think what everybody's saying, it's like, oh yeah, that, that, that. And I've got this like tally in my head of <laughs> things that I definitely agree with. And, um, you know, the cleaning of equipment in the morning, it's a time suck, but you know, it's safety first. And that's just kind of what you do. And, and I think that safety first mentality, it's like, yeah, none of us want to be dealing with this, but all of us are. So do it right. And not like, we are pretty easy going, no ego type of a thing uh, on any set, but not when it comes to safety. So like, we're not doing it to be rude we're you know and we had a, a shoot that was like the couple days after the huge black lives matter protests and we had two crew members through social media we knew were there and so we just called them up and said hey man we can't have you guys we i mean we called them individually and had an honest conversation but we replaced them on our crew because we didn't want that responsibility or that just it was just a lot to bring someone that was just around like 10,000, 50,000 people to a set. So um, that was a weird conversation to be having with anybody that you never thought you'd have. Um, Cause it was people that we work with all the time, you know, so. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Pete, do you, did you, have you had experiences like that where, I mean, I don't know, like people have, you know we're lucky where it, ha it hasn't seemed like really rampant where a whole set of crew or cast has like gotten sick mm. but here and there there have been a couple people and so what do you do to act fast like you had to make the hard decision to uninvite those crew people and that and you know how hard that is because this is the livelihood of folks but also if everyone on the set had gotten sick that was the yeah. livelihood of everybody there so that was you know the right thing to do but but what if somebody did get sick? Have you, you yeah, know, so we, specific because we, it's, you know. Yeah, we've been lucky, you know, it, it's the, the, the virus has kind of seeped slowly into the production community here very randomly. Uh, we haven't had a big outbreak, uh, luckily in knock on wood. And, you know, and, I, and that's in a, um, a testament to the crews really, I think being mindful and, and aware on set. And, you know, we've had, I'd say a 99% success rate with, with people, you know, adhering to the guidelines and, and playing ball and, and really working to keep everybody safe. So that's been great. 
you know, as I mentioned, we have been testing on a regular basis. We have a larger crews. Um, we had a, um, an instance where one crew member uh, was on a, a, a different set and couldn't go to testing when in our window uh, that we had established with a, a local lab. And um, that person went later and got a, the test results back um, like at 7 p.m. the night before a 6 a.m. Uh, call time. And I got a call and they said that they got their test back and they were positive. So obviously it was, you know, we released them for the day and, and, and made sure that uh, they were okay. But at that point, we also asked, you know, it was like the same thing. Okay, I'm glad, you know, how you feeling? You know, I want you to obviously take care of yourself. But where were you last week in the last two weeks? And what sets were you on? And now it's 7 p.m. the night before 6 a.m. call and we're contact tracing back to see if there was anybody else on those sets that this person might have been on. And so we actually lost two key uh, positions on the set less than 12 hours away from call time. And, you know, then my line producer is now a grip and I'm now craft services and like, you know, everybody just stepped up. But, you know, that's what was super important was even if you have the smallest shoot, having that log of who was there and, you know, uh, even as basic as a, a call sheet for the smallest, it may, it may seem like just a small couple person crew, but having a call sheet or something that we can get to at the last minute uh, is super important and helpful for us in case that stuff comes up. Like I mentioned, I work with a ton of freelance talent and they're, um, they're family and partners to me and I couldn't do it without them. And, you know, it's not my job to tell them what sets they can and can't work on and just, you know, I've seen it firsthand that they're they're adhering to guidelines. So if I'm running my set safely, I'm hoping everybody else does too, but that's out of my control. Um, so I think they all get it. And I, and, and, you know, when we call and say, Hey, listen, you were exposed, you know, that, that's another fun conversation. This, this, you know, another person was like, Hey, by the way, when you were on that shoot last week, so-and-so just tested positive. So um, not only do you, not get to work tomorrow, but you probably should go get tested yourself. And, you know, it's like being the bearer of that news is a weird position to be in as a producer too, you know? So, um, so yeah, I, I think, you know, that's, that's been the, the toughest thing. Um, but again, for, for everybody's sake, having that, that log of, of people, you know, cause sometimes it, it's happened to me twice now. The, the one that was before call time was the toughest one. The second one was a couple of a week or so after a shoot that we were on one of our um, freelance talent um, got a positive test back and they called us. We contact traced it back to where the exposure of this person was after our, our um, shoot day. You know, uh, we, we shot with this crew member before the exposure, but we still went and had everybody tested that was on our crew just to make sure that, you know, that was certainly the case because I mean, well, are you guys all, all the panelists is has testing become an easy thing to to do for your sets has it become easier over time i think it's become easier um i've gotten a handful of tests and at first it was like oh man where do you even go how do you do it and yeah. i think that was the most frustrating thing in the beginning was just the lack of leadership from a top-down way above our industry but um it was just like where do i go what do i do who pays for it is insurance i mean it was just like a unknown territory and now there's places that you can almost walk in every five minutes and get a test or um get a whole slew of tests sent to you and you know if you're able to do them the right way um there, there's mail options so yeah it's definitely opened up a lot Rachel, you worked a lot with labs. Yeah, I've had to do a lot of testing. I've probably been tested like 40 times. So yeah. I, I um, I've, my situations have been a little different because uh, we've had um, uh, testing available on set. Um, so every day someone was getting testing and a lot of what my job is, is to coordinate that entire process. Was your, so, on your job, was that a local lab or was that no so we uh we did not use a local lab at the time it was really hard to find labs that could process tests 
quickly and they also needed to be a specific kind. Um, networks can be very particular about the type of testing they allow. Um, a lot of times they won't um, go for any sort of saliva test. Um, they do have PCR tests that are saliva tests now, but at the time they didn't. And so the only type of test that they um, felt comfortable with were the deep nasal swabs, the one that we all love and adore. Um, and so those, uh, the way it was set up on most of the projects I've worked on is there's an in-house team of medical professionals who um, are there every day to test people. And then those um, samples are shipped out. Um, I think we used a lab in Virginia and um, talk about like a money, uh, we had to like courier them by car to Virginia every night from St. Louis. So it was, um, incredibly expensive and and a lot of deep you know logistically very difficult um, but it just wasn't as accessible then um, and it's already become much uh, easier to do and now testing is uh, you know there are more accurate forms of testing that aren't as like uncomfortable and invasive and um, which is really great uh, but yeah I, I do know from sort of consulting and helping people set up their systems, it can be really difficult to like find a lab that makes sense. And, and sometimes the people that administer the tests aren't connected to the lab. And so then you have to find that vendor and um, it, it can be a lot of pieces to put together. But ultimately, if you have the ability to, and you have, you know, it's it can be incredibly uh, helpful, not just in the sense that like, you know, you're safe, but I have experienced that there's an ease that people feel when they are knowing that they're coming to a set where everybody has been tested and everybody they yeah. know is and Pete, um, clear. you used a local lab. And Austin, have you had experience with local, working local? How, how are your testings going locally? It sounds like Rachel, you know, huge project, hundreds of people had to bring an on-site lab that came out of Virginia for one of her projects, but has have local labs been easy to work with for you maybe? That information might be interesting and nice for our audience to know. Yeah, uh, I'll jump in. Um, the we uh, found a local lab here in St. Louis that um, we're they gave us our own promo code. So when people kind of went in and uh, went online to schedule their their test at their convenience, they were able to put in a promo code, which then uh, not only helped with billing purposes, but um, you know we could kind of get a report back. Um, that um, uh, that they were there and kind of kind of checks and balances, and then um, flexibility wise, they've been uh, great to work with uh, simply because like on on shoots where you know they're they're on a certain part of town, you know the metro in St. Louis isn't giant, but you know when other when people have other things going on or being on other shoots, we've actually had some of their technicians come to a central studio and then kind of. Uh, administer the tests and then process them offsite and then uh, get the results to us later that afternoon. So, so, so is it a matter of like calling, finding out, like just looking up, Googling who local labs are and reaching out and seeing, will you work with us? I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of how I, I initially did it. I, um, yeah, I initially found a, a, just an urgent care. And then again, it was the, the turnaround time on tests they couldn't guarantee. And obviously, we want to get the, the tests done close enough to call or close enough to day one of production that, you know, people aren't running out and, you know, it's a few days have gone by and they've been living their lives and, right. and you know, that potential for exposure is kind of reset. So, um, I mean, that's, that's been the, the best um, situation. I think the crew, uh, from what I heard, feels it's convenient for them um, because obviously if they're scheduling it on their own time online, that, that is super helpful. And, so we've done it both ways, really, and um, you know I, I think it's been successful so far. And that's for all of our audience who might need to coordinate something like that. We're getting a lot of questions in. I'm going to throw some of them at you that are coming in from the chat, and then we'll go to the live Q and A. Um, so this is for for everybody. Uh, so we've got somebody uh, talent agency wise. Now this might be a question for Austin and Pete. Uh, can can people coming to work for you, whether it's crew or talent or an agency or a talent agency, ask you for your safety uh, one sheet, or you know, is that is that something that you're used to them doing, and can they do that? 
should that be a part of the routine now or where you're just making sure that they have how you're going to keep everybody safe in front of them? I would say, yeah, they can totally ask us, but I would also say in most cases, we have probably already sent it out before they would even have a chance. It's just like part of their, their booking email or, you know, whatever is happening, they know how it's going to be, I would say, before they would sign up for anything. So it's totally appropriate to ask for it. And hopefully the companies are, are being, you know, proactive in doing that as a matter of their new routine. Another question um, is, is about, you know, like that accountability piece. If there's somebody, if somebody's exposed or has COVID, and, and I know that Pete kind of talked about this, who is the responsible party for notifying the others that there may have been uh, an exposure? Would you say that that's the production company's role? Uh, the producer's role, the agency's role? Whose role would that be? Or is it the, you know, the personal responsibility of the, of the person themselves? What, what are your thoughts on that? And I know this is kind of a complicated question, you know, but how, how I guess, how are you handling that? How would you handle that? Uh, well, in, in my experience, like I said, when, when I've gotten the, um, the call that someone that was on our set was exposed or someone that was going to be on my set that we had to release had been exposed, you know, obviously the, the set that, um, you know, that person needed to contact the set that they traced it back to, right? And then hopefully that production company called everybody that was on that call sheet. Um, the due diligence that, in my case, was to call the people that was that were immediately affected on my upcoming production is how is how I handled it. I wasn't going to, you know, the so the the person who tested positive they needed to contact the people who they were on the set with prior. Um, as a producer, my job um, was to contact the the ones that were going to be on my set coming up, and then, you know, obviously, and that was one of the things that I called uh, Joni about in the beginning. I'm like. We do a lot of healthcare uh, production, and and you know, I was immediately worried. Like, am I breaking HIPAA laws if I ask this person? Like, you know, or if I tell somebody that, so you know, how does that work? Like, we got to be like super careful on how we tell the crew that you know, without you know, breaking any um, privacy laws. Like, I was that was like a big thing in my head. I'm like, how do we how do we navigate this space? But like I mentioned, um, you know, for me as a as a producer, obviously, if we were to get a call saying that, you know, after the fact that someone um, tested positive and traced it back to, you know, right around our last production, then it's a matter, you know, of me just informing the the crew that was there um, that there was a potential exposure. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's definitely new new territory. New territory. And Eric, can you talk to HIPAA laws? Um, are there compliance issues, and Rachel, you might be able to talk to this too, the compliance issues regarding confidentiality are, yeah. are this. So with, with A, doing the notifications, but also, you know, when you're walking in and getting a sheet of information on everybody, how do you, how do you maintain the HIPAA compliance? Um, some reason I can't get my video to turn back on, but anyway, um, yeah, I, I, worked with um, our hospital HIPAA people as I developed kind of the COVID, quest COVID questionnaire. And um, they told me, it was tricky and I'm trying to remember because it doesn't seem, anyway, basically the questions I had come up with, uh, which are modeled after the CDCs were okay to ask. Um, best practices to not leave that on my clipboard so that when I walk away, you guys can flip through my, so I have one. Anyway, just so to protect it once you get it, but um, and I'm kind of relying on them and leaning on them for if they were saying it's fine, because uh, we're, they're very strict with the stuff we have, you know, like when I'm dealing with patients. So um, the, at least the COVID questionnaire is, is okay. But now, like what Pete was saying, or you can't just say, hi, crew, we just, Eric tested positive. So just say a crew member tested 
Uh, I mean, and maybe I missed that. As in I'm... the chat, say something like "not cleared for work" rather than saying. Oh yeah, sure, but but not saying calling out the person, um, keeping that private. Okay, Rachel, you're you're agreeing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I would say, um, in my experience, you don't state the person's name. Um, we never used the words, uh, we never even used the words like negative or positive. It was always cleared. Um, even technically, even like a person's temperature is their own private, like health information. So you can't share anything that has their temperature on it. Um, if someone were to test positive, it would be the crew would obviously be informed of which um, well, if it's a certain, uh, like on your bubble your your department you, that, know what the, that depends truthfully that actually depends on like from what I understand like it depends on the production itself um, I think you could oftentimes I would imagine you would just inform the department head and then sort of discuss it because at some point it will become clear who has uh, tested positive if they're no longer there, um, especially if it's happening like during a shoot. Um, but if it's, uh, if you discover it after and you're doing contact tracing, um, that would obviously be one of those things where you would, you would have to know which department it was in order to have a better understanding of who they were around. And in those situations, like when we were discussing earlier about whose responsibility it is, I think generally speaking, it's probably a good idea before you even start to um, make sure that at least one person on your set has some sort of like contact tracing training. Um, they offer courses and a lot of CCOs will have done that training. Um, but I, I don't know that it's always a given that a CCO um, should have that responsibility. So having that discussion beforehand um, as a producer, I would just, you know, if that did happen, I would want to know whether that responsibility then fell on me or if you had someone with experience that could, you could tap to handle that for you. Um, I, I think is pretty helpful. Um, yeah, yeah it's sense, it's sense it up. up. So it's just like the yeah. jobs get bigger and bigger and more robust and more hats have to be worn. So I like that idea. And I didn't know that that, that I wasn't a hundred percent clear that there's just a place where you can get trained looking. So just Google, Google. There's a, I did a Johns Hopkins course. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like an eight hour course and I think it's free now. Um, that is for contact tracing. There are several different kinds. It doesn't make you an expert by any means, but it's, it's good to have that sort of um, baseline knowledge, especially if you are, you know, I, I've been lucky that there are, you know, generally like medical professionals on the shows that I've worked on, but that's not always plausible. And so I think it's important that we do our due diligence to know as much as we can. A medic and somebody like Eric, who's got this environmental, I mean, there's, and, and everyone valid and needs to be there. Uh, we're getting yeah. some more questions in our uh, chat, but I do want to bring it live so that people can speak for themselves if you guys will st stay with us for a few more minutes. Um, so let's, ad Administrator, can we bring everybody back and then we'll do, we'll probably sharp start with Shelly Wagner, who has a, a question about union sets, non-union sets, which need to have that compliance person on set, which don't. Um, Maybe we can get Shelly to answer, ask her question herself. Shelly. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, yeah, I was just curious on all these um, sets that you guys were talking about, if they were union or non-union, because it is required uh, through SAG-AFTRA to have uh, COVID safety officers on set and they have to be certified. Now you can have one person do it if it is set is a, if the cast and crew is small around 10 but you have to have an actual safety department that's added into the budget if it's a larger crew and they have to have staff personnel who are on set making sure that the protocols are enforced they handle the testing they handle all the information between the producers and the cast and crew so there is more um, control over that um, violation of HIPAA content and that sort of thing. So I was just wondering, is anybody using these COVID safety officers? Have they looked at the um, SAG-AFTRA um, documents that have been put out? Um, because they also um, have an approved list for certified um, safety officers as well. And Shelly, you are SAG, so that's where you're coming from with all this good information. Guys, yes, I, I actually sit on the SAG board and um, um, have been 
really talking to a lot of people about implementing some of these um, procedures and things. So I'm just curious um, how it's handled here because I know not always do we have the luxury of doing um, a right. lot of things that they, yeah. So I was just curious. And I can speak to that a little bit just from my sitting as the film office director uh, locally, there have more times than not, there is some kind of compliance person appointed. Um, whether or not they're certified, I, I don't, I think at the beginning that it was just like, do we have a body? Cause we need somebody dedicated to it. Cause, cause everyone else has a million things to, to think about. So one person can be dedicated to this. And I think as time went by more and more people took some certifications online and things, Eric for sure is, is like overly certified. He's multi-year certified. So having somebody like an Eric is perfect. And it's one of those questions too, like, is a medic, does it fill that role and are they already qualified because they're a medic? It's, those are some of the questions they, that have come they up. They do, but they still have to be certified. So if you use a registered nurse or you use a medic on set, um, who, they who still have to go through this. worked a union job during COVID? Pardon me? Who, who on our oh. panel has worked a union job during COVID? Austin? Has Rachel's all are of the productions um, I've been on have been union, and they all have very extensive, uh, you know, several CCOs, um, medical staff there for testing, uh, uh, an entire department for COVID. Okay, and Austin has, but so Pete, Eric, you've worked on non-union sets, but you've had a compliance officer on those sets, correct? Correct. Yeah, we uh, we were on both non-union and union just depending on the the project the client and um the situation uh we've been running and, and regardless even if we're running a non-union shoot we run it by typical union rules and and things like that so um and yes we've been trying to keep up with uh all of the the different changing guidelines i know that there was a document that was put out i think on the 22nd of december that also updated um between the the um uh, the SAG and IATSE and the, the other uh, folks that were involved in the, in the document. Um, so yeah, we've been trying to keep up with all the changing compliance guidelines and things like that. Um, the new one came but, out for indie film producers yeah. too. Yeah, so that's helpful Correct. for any of you indie filmmakers out there. There is one for indie film. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the and that was part of the reason, you know, one of the, the big advantages of having Eric come to St. Louis for our first um, larger shoot, uh, and uh, I, I'd love to get you back here, Eric, uh, in the near future, but, you know, having someone with his expertise to kind of help the people who had been certified. So yes, we've been hiring people who have taken certification courses. Um, you know, I think a lot of people luckily in St. Louis decided that that would be a good use to their time while they were sitting, <laughs> sitting at home uh, in the early months of the pandemic was to, to kind of get certified and, and learn more about it. Um, and having Eric there on the first set was super helpful because then there were things that, you know, that weren't covered in the course or things that we weren't even thinking about. Um, and it really helped kind of um, set the tone for our future productions that way, because then we could kind of have an idea of the extra things we needed to look for that, um, you know, weren't necessarily covered. You know, it's, it's kind of like hands-on experience, right? Just trying to, to figure it out as we go along and having that uh, additional layer of expertise that Eric could bring to the table um, it was super helpful for, for the people who had taken those certification courses. So I think we've had as many as three or four um, uh, on the COVID squad uh, on sets. I think there were three on the one that Eric joined us for. So absolutely, depending on the size of the crew, we, we understand that it's a big undertaking. And, um, uh, and I, can, I can definitely share pictures from my uh, kitchen table of making individual crafty bags for a large crew and things like that. I mean, we're just being super, super safe. And I think it's, it's super That's helpful to, to is a big to deal on a set. So just who else has a question out there? You could raise your hand or use the reaction button. I, I'm oh. sorry, Katie, really quick. So that these certifications are my, uh, it's a false sense of security for a lot of these. Um, and so that's a big concern for me. I don't know if you've seen Shelly and Pete, but the, the big one out there is attractive because you get your name on a list online and you get a certificate. 
but all they're doing in the class is reviewing what's in the industry guidelines or industry standards. So they're not teaching you anything. It's stuff you could go read it for yourself, but you just don't get your name on a website or a certificate to show. So those are my concerns with the classes. And I know Steph early on, early on, we talked about me and my colleague creating one that goes into what what does this look like, not just what does it say? How do you do these things? What's the proper way to clean? What's the how is this virus spread? What what does ventilation look like? Some of those things people don't even have never heard of or don't worry about. I feel like we're missing maybe out on helping with that because as time goes on and we're working our day jobs, it's been a struggle to get the off the ground. Plus getting certification, you need a third party to be legitimate. You need a third party body to act as the certifying the certifying body for that course. That's expensive. Um, and it takes time. So I know people are doing the best and the, I don't fault these people for making some money and and creating this course, which is just reviewing the regulations um, or whatever they're called, those standards. That's just a, that was one of my biggest concerns of this whole thing is false sense of security um, with the certifications and then with on-site testing for COVID. But we can talk about that later. Well, that's a good point too, making sure you're ta really talking to the compliance people because there's a whole, like, I know that Eric, you bring a whole kit of things to a set, things you've already thought about, things that the producer's not gonna have to supply, you're gonna supply as that role. And I think asking the questions about what what are, what are you bringing, what do you have, like kind of being really thorough um, to vet your compliance officer. Um, and, and then Shelly mentioned, you know, in addition to if you can, if you can afford it too, to also have an RN or a medic on set as well is, you know, would be ideal. Um, but, but what are some of those things? What do you come to set with as the, as the compliance officer? Uh, sorry, I was reading some of the questions. I do realize <laughs> this stuff is expensive and I don't have a good answer. Um, but anyway. Um, but you bring signs. I have signage that have laminated. You don't have to do that. Um, I bring different size cones, like the real short soccer cones to the bigger cones, like traffic type cones. Those seem to help. I have caution tape. I have lots of painter's tape to put up signage, or sometimes I have to, like on the uh, head and shoulder shoot was in a under construction gym and there was like safety nightmares everywhere. So I was, me and my assistant were coordinating off areas so you didn't cut your arm off as you walked to the set. Um, so not just COVID also. Yeah, yeah. and I, that may have been beyond my, beyond the COVID scope, but- I think being my, safe is 100% necessary. health and safety alarm was going off. Um, all kinds of cleaners, all kinds of PPE. Um, I bring, air purifiers, a um, couple different kinds, bigger rooms, smaller rooms, um, prepackaged mints, because I found that a mint in your mouth with your stupid mask uh, wow. kind of helps you're, out. Okay, you're like the top, the top of the tippy top compliance oh. person if you're bringing mints. Who else has a question? Anybody else have, have anything for us before we say goodbye to our lovely panelists today? Katie. Katie Slayton has one there. Okay. Hi. Um, so my question is kind of twofold. Um, and I was just kind of like thinking about it. So um, obviously like um, Rachel's kind of been on like bigger productions and then there's also, you know, been smaller ones, union and non-union, whatever. Um, but I was just curious because like, as um, Eric was saying, about things being super expensive and um, like a false sense of securities. And I was just kind of curious as to, cause like as the vaccine gets distributed and you know, time goes forward, um, I'm just like, what does this kind of mean for people who are trying to do lower budget things? Because when you can't really avoid all of the requirements for COVID but obviously the expenses add up. So is this kind of gonna be, I mean, are 
smaller budget things kind of really taking a hit and how, and in that sense, like how will that become in the future um, when people do start to get lax? Cause I feel like that's kind of inevitable. Um, so I'm just, yeah. So I just guess I'm just curious, like how do you guys think that that um, will kind of develop and what it kind of means for people who are trying to do lower budget things? It's a great question and it is already a struggle to do, you know, micro budget work. You're already stretching everything so thin and trying to get as much in kind as you can. So this definitely changes your budget and, and it's, and PPE is just going to be a must. I do think that, you know, and, and the panelists can address this too. Your people can bring their own masks, um, things of that nature. Um, still having somebody with their only job being to make sure everyone is is working as hard as they can to be compliant is really important so that i wouldn't sacrifice anything like that um yeah it, it it's just still a struggle i do know like for our local incentive in kansas city any ppe purchased for the production would count as part as long as it was you know purchased within the boundaries of kansas city would be part of what could be a qualified spend. And I do think that other, you know, when you're talking about applying for programs like that, I do believe now PPE and things uh, for production are included in incentive programs when you have them. And, and we're trying to get Missouri's back and, and we would hope that that would be included in a consideration as part of the, you know, part of the equipment needed to do the production. Um, it's a total reasonable thing. and, and that would probably count, but we just need to have that reassurance. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna break in real quick. We're yeah. gonna take one last live question oh, and then we're gonna transition to the next part of, of this meeting. So um, I think David, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Hi, um, I just had a, a really quick question as a recent graduate. Um, and obviously, you know, this is not, uh, the industry that I, anyone expected us to be in at this point in time. But do you have any advice just for, for recent graduates and current college students for trying to uh, start their careers? Um, I'm happy to be like working two internships right now, but they're both unpaid. And one day I'd like to move out of my parents' house. So um, <laughs> any advice would be appreciated. Panelists, uh, especially like the, you guys working at production companies. Do you have any great advice for David? I've uh, talked to a handful of recent graduates, just uh, you know, kicking off the year. It seems like a lot of people are trying to make the rounds and do their thing. And I just keep telling them like, it's never gonna be easy. This makes it 10 times worse. So I really feel for you, but uh, it's only gonna get easier, <laughs> I would say, and just, you know, the hustle never ends and just keep making the rounds and knocking on doors and bugging people. Um, it's tough. So when you say bugging people, do you mean like, can I have 15 minutes of your time for a Zoom meeting? I've got some questions. Is that kind of what you mean? Austin? Yeah, yeah. Email producers, email production companies, email, you know, whatever. And if a month goes by and you haven't heard anything, just kind of touch base with them. And if you get annoying, they will let you know. But if not, you know, you might email the day that we just got a call for a job and it's like, oh yeah, we totally need an extra set of hands, so. And and I think too, just, um, you know, especially in this is new world, um, being a, a utility infielder kind of helps too, knowing, uh, you know, a baseline of a lot of the different departments um, will allow people to kind of plug you in as needed and give you more opportunities instead of saying, I'm just this and I'm just that, you know, especially when you're getting started like on those internships, try to learn as much about the other departments or other aspects of the industry as you can. And then, you know, that'll help increase your opportunities when, um, you know, when they arise. That was a perfect question for our next uh, part here. Um, so this has been great. I want to thank our panelists. This has been wonderful and so timely and helpful. Thank you all for your candor and your honesty. There was some mention, if there are questions, Yep. They can e email them to info at momaonline.com and we can reach out to our panelists to see if they can answer those or find answers for you. So write that down or I'll put it in the chat. 
Yep. And there's been some really great conversation in the chat. I encourage you to take a look at that. That's been wonderful. There's a lot of links to resources and, and stuff there. So awesome, awesome. Um, so this next part we're gonna do is gonna go into a networking. And in real life, networking is awkward and hard enough, but now online, a whole nother level. So we're gonna try to make this as easy as possible. So those of you who don't wanna network, we're totally fine that you hop off um, because we're gonna put you guys into random groups and um, talk about that. But before that, um, before you drop off, don't leave yet, um, next month, this is just part one of a 12 part series for the entire year. And I'm gonna ask Joni Tackett to hop on real fast and talk to us about next month's um, session on um, doing self-taping, another very big thing that's happening right now due to the changes. So Joni, would you talk to us about that? Sure, hi everyone. Um, so next month, it'll be February 20th. And it will be myself, Michelle Davidson, and Kina Ferguson. Kina Ferguson is an actress um, and creative power force, uh, powerhouse, uh, who lives in LA. And she's going to concentrate on film and TV self-taping. Michelle's going to concentrate on commercial self-taping. Um, I'm going to just give an overview of what, what a casting director is looking for, for self-tapes from actors. Um, so this is an important part of all of this COVID set safety process. It's, you know, for those of us who work in the industry, I haven't had a live in-person casting since last March. So we're doing self tapes and we're doing Zoom callbacks and sometimes even Zoom auditions. So that's what we're going to talk about. And we'll be promoting that probably sometime next week. That information will get out about that. Great, thank you. And Kina um, is actually is from Jefferson City and out in LA now. And that's part of the community that we're building that um, you're a Missourian through and through, even if you leave here. And, and I've been trying to collect Missourians in the film industry my entire career. And um, some of them are on this call right now. So da -da -da, we're gonna do this networking thing. I'm very excited, here we go. Um, there's going to be a, a host, I think, in each of the rooms. Um, Stacy, help me out. Um, a MoMA board member or myself in each room. And then we're gonna ask you to do three things. We have, we're gonna do two 15 minute breakout random rooms and talk about first, if everyone will go around the circle and introduce themselves and, and talk about what they do. Go around, if you have time after that, talk about a COVID set experience that you've experienced. Recently, if you want to talk about something that good or bad that has happened on your on for you, and then if we have time after that, share possibly a first uh, production experience, like how you first got into this business. So, um, so David, this is for you. This is the networking. This is for everybody. Um, and we're gonna. Stacy is our rock star uh, tech manager here. He has some. Well, okay. Yeah. This will happen automatically for everybody, and the room will close in fifteen minutes, and then we'll assign you to a different one. So you should get different people. So uh, you don't need to do anything but accept it as it comes through. So here we go.
Glenn, we're in uh, breakout rooms right now, so I'm going to assign you to one of those. fun that was cool well everybody's coming back and then we're gonna do it again here okay wow we were so talking i know there's so much <laughs> is this That's our new fun. room this we're no we're back in the we're meeting in i'm gonna general. send everybody to the new rooms here hang on stacy you're doing great so far so good i Thanks, think we're in decent shape here hi michael yeah i look 10 years younger no i'm teasing <laughs> <laughs> Based on our last session, I wonder if we'll ever reach our hands in a bag of Doritos again. <laughs> all right. Am I right? No. <laughs> You're just okay. going to never share my Doritos anyway, so it didn't matter, Laura. So. <laughs> all right. Here comes breakout number two. So this you're being randomly assigned this time to speed it up. So you, may, you won't necessarily get a host, but you guys know how to do it now. So take off on your own here. Here we go. Okay, Andrea, I think everybody's back. Great. I am thrilled. 35, 36 people stayed for the networking part too. I could not be more thrilled with how this has gone. I want to thank all of you for coming and participating. I want to thank our panelists again, my committee with the with the MoMA committee. All of you have been wonderful. And guess what? We're going to do this again next month. And I hope that all of you come back. It's February 20th. We're going to talk about self-taping and, and how the casting process has completely changed right now. So come back next month. I hope to see you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Go have Bye, lunch. Everybody. Go eat some food. Thank okay. you. <laughs> when can we expect registration to go live for the next event? Uh, ne next week is my goal. So oh, great. Yep. Great. Yep. Just checking. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.